So it's really my pleasure to introduce David, David Bacon. Um, this is the second of two talks that he's giving for us. I just want to mention that tomorrow there will be a third event, which is not itself a talk, but rather an open forum seminar where people can come and just have an unstructured conversation, take it in any direction that you want, um, an agenda that can be set on, this, on site. Um, the overall theme of his visit is The Right to Stay Home, which is a takeoff from a recent book that he wrote, the subtitle which is Justice for Migrant Workers and Sending Communities. David has a long history of working in the labor movement. He was over for 20 years a union organizer, five of which with, with the UFW, right? But also with ILWU and the United Electri Electrical Workers. And am I leaving anybody out? Probably. Um, he's current workers. Okay. Work, Kitty, my boss. All right. Um, but he's also a, quite an accomplished author. In addition to the book I just mentioned, The Right to Stay Home, he's written The Children of NAFTA, Communities Without Borders, Illegal People, How Globalization Creates Migration and Criminalizes Immigrants. And he's got a new book out, of which you no longer have copies here. Oh, there it is. Um, which is actually um, based on a lot of another dimension of his work, which is as a photographer. So this is a book that was co-produced with um, some uh, University of California Press, mm -hmm. and, and the titled In the Fields of the North and Los Campos del Norte. So it's in both Spanish and English, and it's got lots of beautiful photographs. Are we going to see more of them today? Some, although some. these ones aren't, a lot of these ones aren't in the book itself. But. Okay, great. So with no further ado, David, take it away. Okay. Well, thank you, and thanks again to um, University and to um, um, all the people who have made it possible, Sarah and Sarah and Patrick and everyone. Can I interrupt one more time? If, yeah. if, if people weren't here yesterday, we do put up the lectures on our website, so yesterday's will be there in uh, video. You can see this one too and oh. tell your friends about it. You. Worldwide audience. Hey, I didn't yeah. realize. Um, and so I am going to show photographs um, while I'm talking, and, and the reason for it is to, um, so that we, we have sort of an additional dimension to what we're talking about. Otherwise, I think it gets kind of drier. Um, and it's partly remembering that we're talking about human beings, but also being able to see visually what it is that we're um, talking about. So in, in terms of talking about the radical resistance to immigration enforcement, the first thing, obviously, to say is that immigration enforcement didn't begin with Donald Trump. Um, you know, when Ronald Reagan was president, we had big immigration raids. Um, I remember I was a factory worker in Silicon Valley at the beginning of the Reagan administration, and what would happen is that uh, what was then the INS, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, which was the predecessor of ICE, um, they would go to a factory and they would bar the doors, and then they would go down the line, the production line, and they would ask people for papers, and then they would grab the people who didn't have papers and hold them for deportation and deport them. And then what they would do is they would go down to the local unemployment office, and in those years, I don't know what it's like here in Wisconsin, but in California, um, the unemployment office, um, we don't have lines anymore at the windows because they've sort of computerized it a little bit. Um, but in those days we did. And so they would go down to the unemployment office where there were a lot of people and a lot of lines with, you know, reporters and TV cameras in tow. And they would say that they had created jobs and they would then put people on buses and they would take them out to the place where they'd had the raid and um, say that they had you know, created jobs for people by this kind of deportation. So, um, at, you know, the, the resistance to this kind of thing, you know, it's happened all over the country, but the stories I'm going to tell you are really pretty much California stories because that's the history I know. But, um, you know, I'm sure that if we looked into, you know, the same history here in Wisconsin, we would find similar things. And I know for sure that this was also the case in Texas and Arizona and New York and other places. But um, I do know about one plant in um, Los Angeles called Craco. I don't know if you remember the car, Craco car radios. In fact, Craco still exists. 
Um, and so what happened to Craco was that um, workers stopped the plant um, when they saw that the ICE agents were the, getting to the plant and told the um, company owner not to let the migra in. That was a pretty um, major thing for them to have done. And they were helped by somebody who was a hero of the immigrant rights movement in Los Angeles, a man named Humberto Camacho, who was an organizer for the United Electrical Workers. Um, in San Jose, um, local 77 of SEIU, which was the janitor's union there, and the Electronics Organizing Committee of the United Electrical Workers, um, we would get together and we would go out and we would picket plants where this was happening. So Levi's had a plant in San Jose at the time. Selectron, which is a big contract manufacturer like, um, like Foxconn, um, when they would cooperate um, in raids and let the, let the INS and the Border Patrol in. Um, I eventually went to work as an organizer for the Molders Union, and the Molders Union um, filed a suit against the INS um, together with the Asian Law Caucus, or they filed a suit together with the Asian Law Caucus against the INS um, over this kind of um, tactic that the INS was using, saying that the INS was illegally imprisoning people um, in the factory in order to do these raids. And that case went all the way to the Supreme Court um, where we won. Um, so the Supreme Court said that uh, the Migra had to have warrants with the names of the people that they were looking for. Well, the law of unintended consequences. Um, what happened was that in 1986, Congress gave the Migra what they wanted um, by passing the Immigration Reform and Control Act. And the IRCA said that employers couldn't hire workers without papers and that undocumented people couldn't work. And so part of that law, this is a part of the law called employer sanctions, um, forced companies to ask for papers, basically, and to keep records. You know, if you go to work anywhere, you know you have to fill out the I-9 form and declare what your status is. Well, that was a product of IRCA, and that enabled um, the raids to resume because that meant that the employers had the documentation in their personnel files that INS needed um, to go out and get um, warrants with people's names on it. It also said, that same law said that undocumented people couldn't get social security cards. Now before IRCA, anybody could get a social security card by applying for it. So the consequences of this were not just that it, um, you know, allowed, well, it created a whole, <laughs> a whole host of effects. But one of the things that it meant was that undocumented workers kept on paying into the system because employers would keep on deducting the money out of people's paychecks and turning it over to Social Security, but because people couldn't get um, Social Security numbers, valid Social Security numbers, and were working under bad numbers, the people who were paying could never collect the benefits that those payments um, were supposedly paying for. Anyway, um, under Clinton, we had the first really big raids um, as a result of IRCA. Um, for instance, in Nebraska, 3,000 workers were forced out of their jobs in what was called um, Operation Vanguard. And then big raids targeted the janitors in, um, all over California. I remember in, um, over on the other side of the hills from the East Bay where I live, 700 workers um, lost their jobs in that one. Um, the Teamsters had an organizing drive among apple pickers in Washington State. 1,000 workers um, got caught up in that. Meatpacking plants. You know, the INS went in and, and detained people there. Then um, Bush became president, and under Bush, um, Bush sent the Migra in those black uniforms with the submachine guns um, into plants to detain people as though they were at war with workers. Um, you remember here in Wisconsin what happened in Postville, um, not too far away from here, right? Um, but, you know, same thing happened at Smithfield, same thing happened at um, a lot of meatpacking plants, and those workers who were detained at Postville, remember what happened to them. Um, they weren't just allowed to sign voluntary departures. They were charged with felonies for giving a bad Social Security number to their employers. Um, identity theft, the government called it identity theft. Um, then Bush, and after Bush, um, Obama, they began what were called the silent raids. 
So the MIGRA, they took those I-9 forms and they compared them to the Social Security database, which is what E-Verify does, and they pulled out the names of people with bad numbers and then began telling employers to fire those workers. And this happened in thousands and thousands of workplaces all across the country. Um, you know, I, in, in the area where I live, you know, we kind of remember in the labor movement the names of a lot of those factories, you know, you know, the Woodfin Suites, which was a hotel chain where workers were punished for demanding um, a living wage after the town that they worked in passed a living wage ordinance. Uh, those workers were then punished by the employer who suddenly discovered they didn't have um, any documents and were fired as a result of it. You know, the Sheridan Hotel, the Travel Lodge, um, the Kimpton Hotels, this happened a lot in hotels, um, but we had in other, you know, little places, there was a little company that made, a little bakery that made um, bread for schools, do bake bakery, there was a big foundry where it happened, all over the place, um, this was going on. So, um, a lot of the conclusion that unions and immigrant rights organizations came to was that um, it was critical to support workers um, during the times when they were going through this um, ordeal and that the first goal for workers facing this kind of thing was simply to be able to survive the experience and not wind up you know, det um, detained and deported. Um, we still don't know exactly what the Trump administration is going to do. We're seeing a kind of a lot of it unfolding on the ground. Um, but we do know what tools the Migra has for enforcement and what it's done before. You know, the immigration raid, you know, simply coming up to a workplace and detaining people. Um, the I-9 firings, which we've just been describing, charging people with crimes and felonies for using bad social security numbers. But, you know, we can also look at Trump's um, enforcement order, the basic enforcement order, which is still what is governing their policy, which is called Enhancing Public Safety in the Interior of the United States. And so this enforcement order um, directs the Department of Homeland Security to hire, first of all, um, 10,000 new ICE agents, which they are already doing, um, and it would um, triple the current um, immigration enforcement uh, or the current on Border Patrol, or no, not the Border Patrol, but the ICE enforcement um, body of 5,000 people. We are already, even under Obama, we were already spending more federal dollars on immigration enforcement than all the other law enforcement programs of the federal government combined. I mean, I, this is just a mind blower. You know, you combine the budget of the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, of the FBI, of their Treasury Department that goes after, you know, the Secret Service, all of that um, isn't as much as we are now spending on immigration enforcement. Despite, though, um, Trump's threats, the federal government does not have the resources to deport every person in the United States who's undocumented. In 2014, Obama was forced to issue enforcement priorities because of huge protests, us, over um, the number of deportations and the fact that people were being charged with aggravated felonies and uh, as a result of this. So a federal court, um, we have a federal court in Tucson called Operation Streamline. And in the Operation Streamline court, um, that began under the Obama administration. They conduct daily mass trials, oh no, I'm sorry, it began under Bush, of border crossers who were imprisoned and then deported. Um, under, Bush, under Trump's new order though, these priority categories for um, deportation have been vastly expanded to the point where really um, there are no priority um, categories any longer. Um, people with dependents, even citizen children who have a deportation order are now deportable. Um, so are people who are simply charged with a criminal offense, in other words, not convicted, or even people who have committed acts that constitutes a chargeable criminal offense. In other words, any accusation by the police at this point is enough to um, render somebody deportable. Um, this order targets people who have provided what it calls false documents which could include, for instance, any of the 8 million people who have given a bad social security number to their employer to get hired. It includes people who have, quote, abused, unquote, a public benefits program. Well, what does that mean? It could mean 
getting care in an emergency room, for instance, without having the ability to pay. Um, immigration officers are now going to be allowed to target anybody who they sim say simply poses, this is their words, poses a risk to public safety or national security. So that's broad enough to include pretty much anybody. Um, depending on how and by whom these priorities are implemented, virtually any undocumented person can be considered now a priority for deportation. That order once again expands the 287G program, which we spent many, many years battling against, in which the Department of Homeland Security gets local police to enforce um, immigration laws. Currently, ICE only has 287G agreements with 32 law enforcement agencies. Actually, this number is a little bit old. It's, it's starting to expand, obviously, again. Um, but it was reduced to 32 because of protests, because of what happened. I don't know what happened here in Madison and Wisconsin, but I'm sure there are people here who can talk about that. But now it's starting to grow again. Um, when he was still Secretary of Homeland Security, um, James Kelly, before he became Obama's right-hand person, um, and Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General, are going to be given leverage to coerce localities into reversing their sanctuary policies and signing up with 287G. When they make threats about sanctuary, this is what they're after. They are after forcing the police, the local police, to cooperate with immigration authorities because this is what produces people uh, for deportation. Um, the so-called Secure Communities Program under the Obama administration, which we forced the end of, is going to be revived in which any time police take somebody's fingerprints, they get sent um, to ICE, who then have the ability to order the police to hold somebody for deportation if they have no legal status, even if the person never gets charged with anything. Simply having contact with the police and getting your fingerprints taken is enough. So that's what this order says. But we all remember what the, the outpouring of people at the airports when Trump's first order um, banning migration from seven um, Islamic countries, Yemen, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. You know, this is now in its third iteration, this order. But what I'm trying to say is remember what happened when, when Trump first came out with it. I don't know if people stopped the airport here in Madison or people stopped the airport in Milwaukee, but we did in San Francisco. And in fact, there were 50 some odd people who were in detention as a result of this order. And because we wouldn't leave the airport for um, two solid days, those people eventually were able to walk free um, into the streets of San Francisco. Um, so the Department of Homeland Security has also announced that it's enacting a policy of family separation at the border in order to discourage Central American immigrants from coming to the US. In other words, parents are going to be sent to one detention center while their children are placed under the care, quote unquote, of the US government in another. So the Trump administration really is using the threat of family separation in an attempt to deter women and children on fleeing violence in their home countries coming here. But I think that we need to step back and take a look at the larger context for these orders. Because these are coming in a world in which people are being displaced by the millions and in which there is already an enforcement structure that has criminalized many, many of them. So as global inequality increases, so does migration from colonies to metropolitan countries. And this is a global phenomenon. The wars that produce migration in the Middle East are the consequence of colonialism and imperialism that are made worse by rising global inequality. Migration from Central America during the 70s and 80s was produced by wars that were fought to overturn unjust social orders and then US intervention, which produced a flood of refugees um, coming north. Young people here in the United States, especially in Los Angeles, were targeted. Remember the crash unit of the Los Angeles Police Department in what was called the Ramparts neighborhood, who were eventually exposed. The police themselves were exposed as being the um, drug dealers. Nevertheless, young people who were targeted and identified as gang members um, were deported um, back to their home countries, some of which they had left um, simply as, as children or infants. Um, unemployment, maquiladoras, drugs, violence, all of these things produce more migration. And the recent migration of mothers and children fleeing on the one hand 
and then trying to reunite with their families who are already here, part of, who are already here on the other. Migration from Mexico was put on steroids by NAFTA, and economic reforms in Mexico um, forced on a population to benefit corporations. So the number of Mexican migrants living in the United States went from 4.5 million to 12.5 million people um, in the period in which NAFTA was in effect, from 1992 to 2008. Seven million of those people came here without visas because there aren't enough visas for all 12, 12 and a half million people. And about nine to 10 percent of the population of Mexico now lives in the United States. Most of Mexico's young people see their future in terms of migration because the Mexican government and the U.S. government cooperate on policies that prioritize the profits of corporations and investment over high wages, jobs, or high farm prices. And so the big fight, as we talked about yesterday, um, among people on the left in Mexico, or not among them, but they are having with the um, political and economic structure in Mexico, is over the right to stay home. In other words, over the right to an alternative um, to forced migration. And this is something that progressive people, I think, in the United States need to take a look at because it is something that has a direct impact on us here. And um, by having solidarity and support across the borders, we'll talk about a little bit. Um, this has a big impact on our lives and our ability to organize. So what happens then is that our policy, United States government policy, criminalizes this flow of people. And it's been doing this not just under Trump and not just under Bush and Obama, but for decades. In fact, especially since um, the Immigration Reform and Control Act um, was passed in 86, because that was what criminalized work and also began militarizing the border. So in 1986, um, the Immigration Reform and Control Act created a commission to investigate the causes of Mexican migration to the U.S. And it reported to Congress in 1982, and it found, surprise, surprise, that the biggest cause was poverty. And so this commission recommended the negotiation of a free trade agreement. The commission argued that opening the border to the flow of goods and capital, but not people, would in the long run produce jobs and rising income in Mexico, even if in the short run it led to job loss and displacement. So this is the report to Congress itself saying that this was what the consequences of the treaty were going to be. So the negotiation of the North American Free Trade Agreement began within months, and it was sold to the public on both sides of the border as a migration-preventing device. Corporate lobbyists claimed the U.S. exports to Mexico would account for 100,000 jobs on this side of the border in its first year alone. So now we are 25 years into the treaty and we have a scorecard. And the promises of profits from increased investment and freer markets, those promises were kept. But the promises of jobs and benefits for working people were not on neither side of the border. And as the commission predicted, NAFTA did not lead to increasing, uh, NAFTA did lead to increasing unemployment, displacement, and poverty. So workers in all three countries, including Canada, are still living with these devastating consequences, while the predicted long-range benefits never materialized. What has produced migration from the rural parts of Mexico is the same thing that closes factories here in the United States. Green Giant, for instance, closed its broccoli freezer in Watsonville, California, and a thousand immigrant Mexican women lost their jobs when it moved to Irapuato in central Mexico where the company could pay lower wages. Part of the purpose for negotiating this agreement was to allow U.S. agribusiness corporations to sell their products in Mexico and then to use the subsidies that they received here in the U.S. to undercut Mexican prices so that Mexican farmers couldn't sell what they produced. The agreement let big U.S. corporations, for instance, sell corn in Mexico for a price lower than what it cost farmers in Mexico to grow it. And again, those big companies, and we're talking about Archer Daniels Midland, Cargill, Continental Grain Company, they got huge subsidies from Congress, that's basically our tax money, and then they used it to sell corn in Mexico at 19% below their U.S. cost of production. So Mexican corn imports went from $2 million to 10 million tons from 1982 to 2008. And in that same period, the price of pork went down 56%. Mexico imported 30,000 tons of pork in 1995, and in 2010, it was 811,000 tons. And in pork production alone, 
Mexico lost 120,000 jobs, and one U.S. company, Smithfield Foods, now controls over 25% of the market for pork in Mexico. That means that one out of every four meals of pork that a family eats in Mexico is coming from Smithfield Foods. Hundreds of thousands of Mexican farmers couldn't make a living. And as we said yesterday, some of them are living in communities that have been growing corn for thousands of years. Oaxaca is where corn cultivation started. There's a cave near Oaxaca City where they've discovered the first years of domesticated corn in human history. So we owe these communities the fact that we're able to eat corn at all, and yet the people living in those communities have to leave um, in order to survive. At the same time, Mexico could no longer pass laws to encourage their own producers. Mexico before NAFTA had subsidies programs to buy corn and agricultural products from farmers at high prices and then to process and sell them at low prices and subsidized um, government operated stores to benefit poor people. That was the CONASUPO system. Well, this was declared a restraint on the ability of corporations like Walmart to enter the Mexican market and those programs were abolished. And now the largest retailer, in fact the largest employer in Mexico is Walmart Corporation. Mexico had other agricultural product pro programs um, for tobacco and coffee to keep prices from falling too low. And these were also abolished. And when coffee and tobacco prices then fell, the government couldn't buy those products in order to help farmers um, by raising prices. And so thousands of failed tobacco and other farmers from states like Veracruz began coming to the United States. He was a tobacco farmer and then became a wage worker in the tobacco fields of North Carolina as a result of this. In essence, Mexico lost the ability to control much of its economy, especially in the interests of working people and the poor. And as a result, by the government's own estimates, 40% of Mexicans live in poverty and 20% in extreme poverty. And despite the promises made when NAFTA took effect, that statistic has remained virtually unchanged for the last quarter century. The lack of labor rights combined with economic reforms to benefit large corporations is also a strong source of migration. Several years ago, the Mexican government sent the army into all the power plants in Mexico City and fired 44,000 workers in order to destroy the union, the Mexican Electrical Workers Union, um, that worked in those power plants. Not long ago, the government changed the constitution so that it can sell the electrical grid to foreign private investors. That was the reason for firing those workers was um, to be able to allow the privatization of the Compañía de Luz y Fuerza, um, which provided electrical service in central Mexico. The main thing, though, is what about those 44,000 people? Where do we think that they are going to go? In the 23 years since NAFTA was signed, Mexican labor protections, which on paper were greater and better than those here in the U.S., have been rolled back. The last administration of President Felipe Calderón forced through a set of labor reforms to legitimize contingent work and erode workers' rights, and that unions that tried to stand in the way of those changes have been attacked by an alliance between the government and employers. The head of the miners' union, Napoleon Gomez Urrutia, was forced to flee to Canada, where he's still living in Vancouver, when the government threatened to arrest him after he'd condemned his industrial homicide an explosion in a mine belonging to one of Mexico's wealthiest families, the Larea family, whose corporation, Grupo Mexico, now owns mines on the U.S. side of the border as well as on the Mexican side. Meanwhile, a new mining law led to the sale of Mexican, uh, led to the sale of mining concessions, primarily to big Canadian corporations, covering a third of the entire land area of Mexico. In Cananea, Mexican miners went on strike eight years ago to stop this multinational corporation, Grupo Mexico, from eliminating their jobs and busting their union. So when people lose a strike like that and they lose their jobs, remember the border is only 50 miles north. So in a way, miners and electrical workers, by trying to stop these kinds of reforms, what they're fighting for is the right to stay in Mexico because the consequences of losing these fights means that you have to do something in order to survive, and usually what that means is you have to leave. At the same time, NAFTA allowed companies to sue over lost profit opportunities. One case was filed against Mexico by a company called Metal Clad that wanted to burn toxic waste. Energy companies wanted to develop fracking wells all over northern Mexico and consume Mexico if the government doesn't allow them to drill. <coughs> 
Not that the government, the Mexican government at this point, wants to stop them anyway, because it, again, it's given these mining concessions to corporations all over the all over Mexican territory, and the Mexican constitution was changed so that um, these concessions can overrule any local community that tries to stop them. So encouraging rapacious resource extraction then also drives people off the land. The Mexican government holds incomes down in order to encourage corporate investment in industries that are producing for export. And this is the model that was pioneered in the Maquiladoras along the U.S.-Mexico border and under NAFTA has become basically the norm um, throughout the country. What this means in terms of the lives of people is that if you work in a Tijuana factory, for instance, and you're assembling um, flat panel televisions for Sharp Corporation, uh, for the U.S. market, in other words, um, you, if you're a woman on the line, you wind up working for half a day in order to buy a gallon of milk for your kids. Maquiladora workers, as we see here, live in homes that are made from pallets and other materials that are cast off by the factories in varios with no sewers, no running water, and no electrical lines. And because our two economies are linked now, Mexico suffers when the U.S. economy takes a dive. You know, when the recession has started in the U.S. in 2008, what that really meant is that customers in the U.S. stopped buying the products that were made in those maquiladoras, and hundreds of thousands of workers lost their jobs. So remember, border's right there. Where are people going to go? You know, we all love our families. What would you do if you were one of those workers and living in, you know, this barrio here and you lost your job? So markets in Mexico were open to these large corporations. Mexico had a domestic content law, for instance, that um, required foreign auto assembly plants to purchase from domestic suppliers. Those plants are producing not for the Mexican market, but for the U.S. market. And when NAFTA was scrapped, um, those domestic, I mean, when NAFTA passed, those domestic content laws were scrapped. Many domestic producers no longer had guaranteed customers and their factories closed. Market reforms privatized other industries as well. One family became the owner of the most important railroads. Another of its national steel mill, Carlos Slim, for instance, bought the telephone company at bargain price and is now reputedly the world's richest person, becoming the second largest shareholder in the New York Times, which might have something to do with why Tom Friedman and the New York Times are such ardent defenders of this agreement. Um, in Mexico and in developing countries all over the world, people want an alternative, a, the right to a decent life in the communities where they live, which is the right to stay home. So the migration becomes a choice, something that's voluntary, not forcible. In other words, people are not saying that migration should be a crime or that there's something bad about it, <clears throat> just that you should have the ability to say yes or the ability to say no. In the system here in the United States, um, workers, uh, in the, the economic system here in the United States depends on migration and migrants. If everybody went home tomorrow, there would be no fruit and vegetables in the supermarkets. Who's going to cut up the cows? Who's going to clean the offices? Who's going to make the beds in the hotels? But who pays for the needs of the workers and the families in the towns that people are coming from? Who pays for the schools, for paving the streets? in the towns that are supplying the labor force into the fields and the uh, meatpacking plants of the United States. Growers, building owners, meatpacking companies, they pay for nothing. Workers are paying for all of it. And since they can't really pay for everything they need, Santiago Huslahuaca, for instance, the town in Oaxaca that sends hundreds of workers into the fields, strawberry fields in California, has no water or sewage treatment plant. If somebody in the family of a worker in the United States gets sick, perhaps that worker can send enough money home to pay for a doctor. But for Huxtlahuaca's residents who have no one in the U.S. to pay for it, there is no doctor because the Mexican healthcare system is falling apart under the impact of this system. So to employers, migration is a labor supply system and for them it works well. It's not broken at all because they don't have to pay for what the system really costs, either in Mexico or in the United States. Trade policy and immigration policy are inextricably bound up with each other. They're part of the same system. And NAFTA didn't just displace Mexicans, it displaced people in the United States too. 
You know, until 2005, the Department of Labor kept track of workers who lost their jobs under the agreement. If you could show that you lost your job due to NAFTA, you qualified for unemployment, extended unemployment benefits. And so the Department of Labor kept count of who all those workers were. Well, when Bush became president, he ordered the Department of Labor to stop counting because it became a political embarrassment to people in Congress who had voted for the treaty. And by that time, it was about half a million people. By 2010, trade deficits with Mexico had eliminated 682,000 jobs in the United States, most of them in manufacturing. I don't have to tell you here in Wisconsin because Wisconsin sure lost a lot of them. <clears throat> so since in the last few decades, for instance, taking a look at Detroit, Detroit lost half of its population as the auto industry left. And today, every engine in a Ford is made in Mexico. But the working families who lost those outsourced jobs, they didn't just disappear. Instead, what happened here in the United States is that hundreds of thousands of people began an internal migration here within the United States that is larger than the Dust Bowl displacement of the 1930s. During the period of NAFTA, our wages here in the United States have remained virtually flat. In 2006, the Economic Policy Institute found a nationwide loss of $7 billion in wages that would have been earned um, had NAFTA not passed. NAFTA strengthened the ability of U.S. employers to force workers to accept lower wages and benefits. One out of every 10 employers in the United States facing a union drive now says that they'll move to Mexico. In 20 years, the number of people in the U.S. born somewhere else went from 23 million to 42 million people, and this is the period in which NAFTA went into effect and market-based economic reforms were implemented in countries that are the source of migrants to the U.S. So I'm not trying to dump specifically on Mexico here. Mexico is an example of what happened in this relationship between the U.S. and Central America, the U.S. and the Philippines, and it's not just the U.S., because you can see the same thing happening between you know, Great Britain and Pakistan, between France and Algeria. This is globalization as it um, is unfolding all over the world and what its impact is on working people. But in the U.S. there was another consequence of the connection between NAFTA and immigration policy, and that was immigration enforcement. At the border, in raids and communities, and in the workplace, all of these things accelerated during the period that NAFTA was in effect, and this is not an accident. Immigration and Customs Enforcement says that audits the records of about 2,000 companies every year. So thousands and thousands of people are getting fired um, in these um, immigration I-9 checks. But people obviously are not just fired. People are picked up and deported. You know, under Obama, we have what? 300 to 400,000 people who were um, picked up and deported every year, over 2 million people um, in total. What's really happening here is that enforcement is pushing workers into the informal sector where nobody asks for immigration papers, but where wages are only half of what people were making before they were fired. And this doesn't create any jobs. Instead, what happens is that workers lose their homes when they can't pay the mortgage, or they can't pay the rent. Enforcement doesn't punish employers who exploit immigrants, because when, when an employer fires workers as a result of an I-9 check from ICE, they get immunized from prosecution. So the only people who lose in this are the workers themselves who get fired. And even more important, this kind of enforcement has an impact on the ability of people to create social change by implementing immigration raids where workers are organizing or protesting against injustices. So this system, it produces displaced people and then it criminalizes people when they migrate. It makes people vulnerable and low wages mean higher profits. U.S. immigration policy doesn't stop people from coming. What it does is it determines the status of people once they're in the U.S. to benefit large financial interests and mainly employers. Immigration policy is intended to supply labor to employers. Take a look at the CIR bills, the Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bills, that were in Congress under Bush and then under Obama. They're primarily labor supply bills. And that labor should have a low cost to be imposed and determined by employers, and the workers themselves should be made vulnerable by it. So we know that over 350,000 people are kept in detention annually. The U.S.-Mexico border is like an armed camp with 20,000 Border Patrol agents, the federal government spends more money on immigration enforcement than all the other law enforcement programs combined, 
And at the same time, more migration is inevitable because of all of these economic changes that we're talking about. More border patrol agents on the border produces jobs in the U.S. and high levels of enforcement also ensures the profits of the companies that manage detention and enforcement who lobby for deportations as hard as Boeing lobbies for the military budget. But neither the border patrol agents nor the detention centers nor the walls are going to keep people from crossing the border. What about that wall? Is the wall going to stop people? Boeing got a contract under Bush to begin building sections of the wall, remember, with electronic sensors and lights and so on. And about 700 miles, Boeing built about 700 miles of that, that border and pocketed over seven, $4 billion in the contract um, to do that before Boeing then told the federal government that its effort was a failure and that the contract was canceled. So now more companies, we just saw in the paper, right, the, that, that thing in San Diego where they, in San Isidro, where they had the, the eight different companies put up their sections of the wall to see who was going to build the biggest, most powerful wall and get the contract. But the wall doesn't stop people because the force that's pushing people to come is so great that people find a way anyway. But it is a potent symbol. And Trump ran for office to the chance of build the wall, remember? And enforcement doesn't exist for its own sake. It plays a role in a larger system that serves economic interests by supplying the labor force that employers require. In a society with one of the world's highest rates of incarceration, crimes are often defined very broadly. Under President Bush, federal prosecutors charged workers with felonies for giving a false social security number to an employer when being hired. And some of Trump's advisors, like Bannon for instance, have held that just simply crossing the border itself is a crime and should be a felony, and therefore all undocumented people are felons. And he wasn't the first person to do this. Remember, Sensenbrenner had a bill in Congress to make felons, to make it a felony simply to be in the United States without papers. That was why we had all those marches in 2006, was in order to get rid of that bill. Both deportations and workplace firings, though, they face a basic <coughs> obstacle, and that is that the immigrant workforce is a source of immense profit to employers. Immigrant labor is more vital to many industries than it's ever been before, and immigrants have always made up most of the country's farm workers, for instance, in the West and the Southwest, and today, according to the U.S. Department of Labor, about 53% of the country's entire agricultural workforce is undocumented. But the list of other industries that are dependent on immigrant labor is also very long. Meatpacking, some construction trades, building services, janitorial services, health care, restaurants, hotels, retail trade, more. The Pew Hispanic um, Center estimates that of the presumed 11 million people who are in the country here today without papers, about 8 million people are employed, which is about 5% of the entire U.S. workforce. Most of them are earning close to the minimum wage, some people far less than that, and they're clustered in low-wage industries. Um, as we talked about yesterday, in the indigenous um, farm worker survey, Rick Mines found that a third of the indigenous farm workers in California reported that they were making less than minimum wage. In other words, employers were paying thousands and thousands of workers illegal wages um, in California alone. The minimum wage is still stuck, the federal minimum wage, at $7.50 an hour, and even California's minimum of $10 an hour is only giving full-time workers an annual income of $20,000. Try to live in California on $20,000 um, a year. You're just not going to be able to do it. So Social Security says that the national average wage index for 2015 was just over $48,000. What this means really is that if, um, if employers were paying undocumented workers the average U.S. wage, it would cost them well over $200 billion every year. And that wage differential subsidizes entire industries like agriculture and like food processing. If that workforce were withdrawn, as Trump says he's going to do, right? Through deportations or mass firings, employers wouldn't be able to replace it without raising wages drastically. So as Trump increases enforcement, 
employers are going to demand workers. He's going to have to ensure that the labor needs of employers are met at a price that employers want to pay. The corporate appointees in the Trump administration reveal that any populist rhetoric about going, uh, say, talking about going against big business is just that, rhetoric. But you know, Hillary Clinton would have had the same, faced the same basic necessity. And in fact, immigration reform proposals in Congress from both Republicans and Democrats over the past decade have shared this understanding, which is that the goal of U.S. immigration policy is to satisfy the labor demands of the economy. And when they say the economy, what they're talking about are corporations, employers. During the congressional debates over immigration reform, the Council on Foreign Relations proposed two goals for U.S. immigration policy. In a report from the, um, the Independent Task Force on U.S. Immigration Policy, senior fellow Edward Alden stated, quote, we should reform the legal immigration system so that it operates more efficiently, responds more accurately to labor market needs, and enhances U.S. competitiveness. When the Council on Foreign Relations speaks, this is the people who really run the U.S. economy telling us what their policy is and what they want. And then he went on to add, we should restore the integrity of immigration laws through an enforcement regime that strongly discourages employers from operating outside that legal system. So the Council on Foreign Relations here, what they're doing is they are coupling an enforcement regime with deportations and firings and a labor supply scheme. And this framework assumes that the flow of migrating people is going to continue, and then it is seeking to manage it. And this is a safe assumption because the basic causes of that flow have not changed. Communities in Mexico continue to be displaced first by economic reforms that allow U.S. corporations to flood the country with cheap corn or meat, dumping, by the rapacious development of mining and other extractive concessions in the countryside, the growing impoverishment of Mexican workers. And violence plays its part linked to the consequences of displacement, economic desperation, and now mass deportation. And the continuing U.S. military intervention in Central America and other developing countries is going to produce continuing waves of refugees. So while Trump railed against NAFTA in order to get votes and talks about negotiating it now, he cannot, given his ties to business and has no will to, change the basic relationship between the United States and Mexico and Central America or other developing countries that are the sources of migration. The structures for managing the flow of migrants are already in place and they don't require Congress to pass any big immigration reform bills. In Washington state alone, the Washington Farm Labor Association brought in 2,000 workers under the H-2A guest worker program in 2006. Last year, it reached 13,500 people. Next year, it's estimated that Wafla is going to bring in just one labor contractor alone, 16,000 workers. That's a third of the agricultural workforce in the state of Washington. That kind of growth is taking place all over the country. Um, wherever you find a sizable agricultural workforce, and I'm sure in Wisconsin this is happening too. Last year, the national total of H-2A visas was 165,000, and next year the government, our government is predicting that it's going to be over 200,000 people in agriculture. That's 10% of the agricultural workforce in the United States. <coughs> the program for foreign contract labor in agriculture is only one of several like it in other industries. One study called Visas Incorporated by the Global Workers' Justice found that over 900,000 workers were brought to the United States to work every year under similar conditions, and that number is growing. And in the context of the growth of these programs, immigration enforcement fulfills an important function. It heralds a return to the Brasero era, named for the um, guest worker program that brought millions of Mexican farm workers to the United States between 1942 and 1964. In 1954 alone, the United States deported over a million people and then imported 450,000 braceros in that same year. So historically, immigration enforcement has been tied to the growth of contract labor programs. The growth of this system is not inevitable. We have to think about what kind of system would be better for migrants, the communities that people come from, and for working people generally. The United Nations has an international convention 
on the rights of migrant workers and their families, which guarantees basic rights and equality. And this is where we should begin, not with international guest worker programs. Rufino Dominguez, the former binational coordinator of the Frente um, Indígena de Organizaciones Binacionales and formerly the director of the Oaxacan Institute for Attention to Migrants, told me once, what would improve our situation is legal status for the people already in the United States and more visas based on family reunification. Decent wages and investing money in creating jobs in our countries of origin would decrease the pressure forcing us to leave home. But making it illegal to work is not going to stop migration because it doesn't deal with why people come. Solidarity and the migration of people are linked Oaxaca migrant communities are growing in the U.S. The founders of the Frente Indígena saw that it was possible to organize displaced people who now live in many places in both Mexico and the U.S. When, ha when Oaxacan workers, for instance, went on strike at Sukuma Farms in Washington State in 2013, Bernardo Ramirez, who at the time was the um, binational director of the Frente Indígena in the photograph here, went there from Mexico to help those workers organize because they were coming from those communities in Oaxaca where the Frente Indígena already has chapters. And then when Sukuma tried to recruit guest workers to replace his entire workforce, the Frente Indígena met with the Mexican consulate and the Department of Labor along with other people to try to stop them. Workers in Washington state have a union, Familias Unidas por la Justicia, because of what other migrants from Oaxaca were able to do, both in the U.S. and in Mexico. Bernardo Ramirez said, when he went to Washington, he said, I'm here as the coordinator of the Frente Indígena because this strike is part of our people's struggle as migrants. When people are, what people are demanding here is justice for them as workers. The growers should give people what the law demands and fair conditions. This is their right. Gaspar Rivera Salgado, who's a professor at UCLA and was also a former binational coordinator of the Frente Indígena, he says, we need our rights as workers and migrants and also development that makes migration <coughs> voluntary, the right to stay home. Both rights are part of the same solution. But the right to not migrate has to be more than the right to be poor, the right to go hungry and homeless. To decide freely whether to stay home and leave, each alternative has to provide a dignified future to people. And those rights are linked to stay home and to equality and dignity when you do leave home. So we have to assess what Trump means and what he intends when he says he wants to renegotiate NAFTA. Is he saying that he, or is he planning to stop U.S. oil companies, for instance, from building cars in Mexico and exporting them to the U.S.? Not a chance. Every flat panel television sold in a store in the United States is made in Mexico or in some other country. But renegotiating NAFTA is not a bad idea if what it means is prohibiting the kinds of measures that have caused displacement. But is this what Trump has in mind? How much change in NAFTA do we need, and how can we fight for it, especially in the kind of political climate that we have now? You know, Mike Michaud, who was a Congress member from the state of Maine, Maine's first gay Congress member, um, and was a former um, union official of the Paper Workers Union in Maine, he proposed, he had a bill in Congress, and proposed, um, um, hearings so that we could tell the truth about what NAFTA's impact was. We need a truth commission in this country and that tells us the truth about what NAFTA did in the U.S., in Mexico, and in Canada so that we don't fall into the trap of they got our jobs and we can see that Mexican workers and farmers lost even more than people did here. We were both displaced. We both went on the road. You know, Bernie Sanders um, Pro propose prohibiting companies that close and relocate factories from getting federal contracts, for instance. That's not a bad place to start. People like Bert Corona here had an alternative to this system. Bert said that immigrants are not helpless victims and talked about the power of organized resistance by immigrants themselves, but also by the community around them. And as a labor guy, he talked especially about the power of immigrants as workers and about the importance of unions. After the election, many cities and state governments and elected officials here in this country after the last November's election were quick to announce that they would not be intimidated. The Dreamers especially see direct action in the streets as an important part of defending their communities. 
In detention centers themselves, detainees have organized hunger strikes with the support of activists camping out in front of the gates. The success of efforts to defend immigrants, especially undocumented people, depends not just on their own determination to take direct action, but on support from the broader community. In Philadelphia, for instance, less than a week after the election, Javier Flores Garcia was given sanctuary by the congregation of the Arch Street United Methodist Church, and I just read in the papers a week ago that he was finally got his visa because of the struggle that took place in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia and was able to walk out of that church after living there for almost a year. And those examples are multiplying. To defeat the enforcement wave, immigrant activists and unions and communities are going to have to fight for a deeper understanding and greater unity between immigrants and U.S. born people. In a diverse workforce, the unity that's needed to defend a union or simply to win better conditions depends on fighting for a country and a workplace where everybody has equal rights. For immigrant workers, the most basic right is simply the right to stay. And defending that right means not looking the other way when a co-worker, a neighbor, or a friend is threatened with firing, with detention, with deportation, or even worse. So the rise of a Trump enforcement wave spells the death of the liberal centrist idea that proposed trading increased enforcement and labor supply programs for a limited legalization of undocumented people. Under Trump, the illusion that there's some kind of fair enforcement is going to be stripped away. Sessions has no interest in humane detention with codes of conduct for the private corporations that are running the detention centers. And the idea of guest worker programs that doesn't exploit immigrants or doesn't set them against workers who are already in the United States is going to face the reality of an administration that's bent on giving employers what they want. So in one way, the Trump administration presents an opportunity for us as well, and that is to fight for the goals that immigrant rights advocates have historically proposed. To counter inequality, economic exploitation, and the denial of rights. As Sergio Sosa, who is the director of the Harlem Workers Center in Omaha, says, we have to go back to the social teachings our movement is based on, which is the idea of justice. That's it. Thank you. So, uh, the floor is yours. Um, so, uh, you know what, I recall from the book, your book, Illegal People, that you describe um, the formation of this big coalition of business interests, corporations and business associations, all of whom, you know, have got together to, for the purpose of promoting comprehensive immigration reform that, in which guest worker programs are the central component. So how has, I forgot the name of it, um, but how has that evolved over time? What role did it play in the Obama administration's vision of a comprehensive immigration reform and the Gang of Eight and all that? And then what role, if any, is it playing today and how does it coordinate with the Council on Foreign Relations? I mean, what's the state of all that kind of organizing on the part of capital? Okay. Um, well, <clears throat> I think what we have to do is we have to go back to 1965. 1965, <clears throat> Corona, Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, the Chicano Civil Rights Movement convinced Congress to end the Bresciano program. That was the first thing. That's what led to the strike in Delano um, the following year was because Filipino workers realized, because they had had their strikes broken by Bresciano before, they realized that the moment had come and they acted. They went on strike in Coachella and then in Delano and that led to the um, UFW and all of the consequences for farm work organizing that we've seen over those years since. <clears throat> then they went back in 65 to Congress, same constellation of organizations and people, and they convinced Congress to pass an immigration law that gave us the family preference system. So, you know, the family preference system has a bad rap these days because um, if you petition for your adult child in Mexico City, uh, if you petition today, you'd have to wait, I think, 22 years. If you petition from the Philippines, it's, what, 25 years. In other words, the waiting lines have become so long that you would easily die in line waiting um, for that visa. And so people, and it also leads, I think, people who are 
very, very, want very much to reunite their families to say, hey, you know, I may have a petition in line, but I am going to try and get to the United States before, you know, the, the name comes up. So the, the, the problem is, is that in the implementation of that system, the Congress and the administrations have started of the visas that it would have taken for that system to work so that you, we wouldn't have these kinds of backlogs. Um, but the idea of these two things happening in conjunction with each other, you end the contract labor program, the Bracero program, and then you put in place an immigration system that is based on reuniting families. In other words, one that benefits us as working people and as families rather than employers. That was the most progressive immigration law that we have been able to get out of our government for, well, since forever, practically. Um, when IRCA passed in 1986, what it did was it took everything back to as it had been before um, by not just making work illegal for workers, but it, it, it reinstituted the Brazil program, the H visa, as it was called in, the, in that law. It, was, it didn't discriminate at that point between H2A and H2B. It was just the H visa, but it reinstituted the contract labor program, and it also began the enforcement on the border. So the same things that characterized U.S. immigration policy during the Brasiano era, they were back in place. And so that kind of idea, and the way it got passed in Congress was this idea of the trade-off, that you trade legalization for people who were already here um, for the labor supply program and enforcement directed at anybody that might be deciding to come. Now, Congress was extremely cynical in doing this for a lot of reasons, and not just that commission that said, you know, pass the trade agreement. They set the date, the cutoff date, for the amnesty at January 1st, um, 1982. What happened later in 1982, you remember? We had the peso shock in Mexico. So a huge wave of people came to the United States because, they, again, they had no economic way of surviving other than doing that. So um, by setting the date where it did, they ensured that there would continue to be an undocumented population here in the United States. Um, so the, and, and the amnesty itself, and especially as we've seen the amnesty proposal, so every, every, every immigration, comprehensive immigration reform proposal we have seen in Congress since 86 has been modeled in the same model. It's always the same trade-off um, in one way or another. And even when you look at the, the legalization parts of it, you see that even though on the surface is presented to us as being something that is going to help us by allowing us to legalize you know, people in our families and our communities who don't have legal status, the way it's set up really, what it do, it's another way of helping employers, or in many cases it is. Um, because what happens is that if you are a meatpacking company, for instance, and you have 3,000 workers in the meatpacking plant, um, and almost all of them are undocumented, and then Congress passes a law saying, e-verify, we're going to come down real heavy, we're going to make you fire everybody who doesn't have um, papers, you know, as a meatpacking company, you would lose your workforce, and that would be economically very difficult. So what happens is that the, the um, legalization program, in a sense, comes into grandfather those people. So, you know, you can have, in some of those CIR bills, the, the legalization program would have people waiting in line for 13 years, 15 years, you know, to be able to apply for a green card. Um, so obviously, people remain in this very kind of like halfway vulnerable state. You get in trouble with the police during that period, you're deportable. Anything that happens to you in your life, you know, you get in trouble you wind up losing that status that you have. So it makes people very vulnerable. But from the point of view of the meatpacking company, it's great. Because your workforce is now grandfathered in. You're not going to face INS, you're not going to face ICE coming and telling you that you have to fire 
you know, 3,000 workers in your plant. So that, even the, what were presented to us as the positive parts of the bill, it's not that they have no meaning to us, because, you know, the th three million odd people that got legalized under IRCA, that was, you know, that was something that benefited people enormously in, in the U.S. And in fact, it helped to change the politics of places like Los Angeles. You know, Los Angeles is the kind of city it is, and California is the kind of state it is, in large part because people um, got their legal status, and then many of them became citizens, they began organizing unions, they voted in elections, political change followed in the wake of that. So I'm not saying that this is unimportant to us. I'm just saying that the way these bills are designed is really by employers. And, that's, and so when you talk about the organization in the book, the organization is called the Essential Worker Immigration Coalition. This was put together by big employers, meatpacking companies, hotel chains, the National Restaurant Association, under Clinton at the end of the 90s to begin crafting an IRCA-like compromise, which would then get introduced into Congress. And the, per first, the first person to introduce it into Congress was Ted Kennedy, a Democrat. So these are not Republican bills. These are, well, they're really bipartisan bills. You know, they, the Republicans and Democrats, they argue with each other over the weight to be given to different parts of the bills. But the basic nature of it is the same. And the basic economic interests that get served by those bills is the same. So the immigration, um, the Essential Worker Immigration Coalition, it lasted for a few years. Mm -hmm. Tamar Jacoby became a high-priced lobbyist in Washington because she was the you know, point person for EWIC, as it was called. Um, but, you know, the bills, they kind of, they outlive the individual organization because the same economic interests are pushing for them all the time because they have lobbyists in Washington. And you know, so you start talking immigration reform, and what you get from the sponsors of the bills is, well, if we want immigration reform, we have to please employers, because that is how we are going to produce the majority in Congress that's going to enable these bills to pass. That was the rationale um, for all of the guest worker programs and all the enforcement parts of the bills that were um, in Congress under Bush and under Obama. Under Obama, you know, the process of being able to, or the, the hope of being able to pass these bills in Congress essentially died um, because of the gridlock in Congress. But the actual implementation of the parts of, of parts of those bills continued on without having to pass anything through Congress. The enforcement side. Well, and the guest worker programs. You know, H-2A, when Obama took office, was what, you know, 60,000 workers. When he left office, it was 160,000 workers. The enforcement, up, 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 you know, the 287G program, you know, the secure communities, you know, part of them were created under Bush, part of them were created under Obama. They were basically bipartisan programs. The, the thing that stopped some of that stuff was us. Us. We stopped it. It wasn't because there was some change of heart um, in Congress or in the administration that suddenly you know, saw the light. The reason why we got DACA was what? Because Dreamers organized around the country. They were able to get organized enough so they began springing people out of detention, remember? People, you know, young people would get picked up and then everybody would go into action and find Congress members who were sympathetic or get out in the streets and protest and eventually people would be um, let out, and finally they sat in Obama's office, campaign office, in 2012, and um, Obama issued, uh, issued the order. But again, it was the movement that produced that. So that, I think, is the lesson for the future, is that not that employers have given up on it. I mean, we know that if, Obama, if, if Trump is telling the world that he's going to have much more strict immigration enforcement, that employers are going to go to the administration and say, well, okay, if you take workers away from us on the one hand, you have to give them back to us on the other. In fact, under the Bracero program, they even had a, uh, they even had a, they, they, they had a name for that process, which was called um, drying out the wets. So what would happen is that, that employers have, might have a, 
a workforce out in the fields of undocumented people. Along would come the INS in those days. They would pick those people up. They would take them back to the border, and they would be recycled and come back to this, even to the same grower as um, as Braceros. And that plane that went down in Los Gatos Canyon that Woody Guthrie wrote the song about, it was carrying people back to the border so that they would then become um, Braceros coming back to work in the United States. So, you know, this is old, 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 old. We've seen this all before. David, thank you so much. Uh, brilliant work and uh, very insightful. Um, you started your talk with, with, with the imperialism word, and, um, you know, it takes me back to the work of Gilbert Gonzalez and Raul Fernandez, you know, 100 years of, of Chicano history, and also the, word, uh, the work by, by, um, by Juan Gonzalez, right, his Harvest of Empire. Uh, and, and to be able to connect imperialism to, to globalization and this new neoliberal agenda that we have here is, is something that we struggled often in the academy to be able to explain it up because, you know, because of how it's taught being such a natural phenomenon of people coming in and moving and, and you know, this is just a natural way things work and I, and I, I wanted to, to get your, I wanted to, to thank you for, for putting that puzzle together for myself. Uh, again, uh, the other thing that I wanted to ask is how does Operation Gatekeeper fit, um, fit within the narrative that you just told us with regards to these different bills that would be proposed or these different pieces of legislation um, as well if you, if you have an opinion on that. Well, just um, about the first your first comment, I think the whole effort of illegal people and the right to stay home and all this stuff is to get us to look at this as a system and not as policies. This is not you know, one interest group fighting for one policy and another one fighting for another policy. And it is not a situation in which you have on the one hand what the US does somewhere else and then the problem of people living as immigrants here in the US as though we're, they were separate, separate parts of reality. They are aspects of, you know, what I call it is really imperial, imperialism's labor supply policy. And, you know, we are not a very good country at looking at the labor aspect of anything. You know, it's sort of been trained out of us. If in Europe and other countries you might, you know, people look at it somewhat differently. But, um, part of the purpose of NAFTA was to produce displaced people. It wasn't just a byproduct. How could it be if the Congress itself had this report in their hands saying, in the short run, this is going to produce displacement and blah, 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 you know? Um, they knew. They knew. And because the production of displaced people and the movement of displaced people is an essential part of how the system functions. Um, and even. Um, you know, our immigration policy and the way we talk about it in this country, especially in the immigrant rights movement, we make these separations that I think are sometimes kind of hide the reality rather than help us to understand it. So we have, you know, people who are considered political refugees fleeing the civil war in Central America, and then we have people who are considered economic migrants who are people who are displaced by NAFTA or whatever and coming to the United States as a result of that. And, and this is, you know, among people who really understand that this is happening, because most people in this country don't even see that. But um, if we look at the wars in Central America, and El Salvador, and Nicaragua, and the Contra War, what were they being fought over? You know, they were being fought over the nature of the social systems in those countries, and whether they were going to function in the interests of working people, or whether they were going to function in the interests of... Um, their own elite and employer class, if you want to put it that way. So, um, to call people who are fleeing those wars just political refugees hides a certain economic reality. And I think also, looking at people who are coming here um, from Mexico as just fleeing poverty and unemployment um, is not looking very clearly at not just the role of the trade agreement in d the dumping and the corn dumping, but also in the security apparatus that develops to keep that system in place. Because 
you know, the purpose of the Mexican army used to be to defend Mexico against the Colossus of the North, the United States. Now, the officers of the Mexican army go to the School of the Americas to get trained. And we have this very, very close military cooperation under the rubric of stopping the war on drugs. But in Mexico, at least, people are pretty clear that the, that the intention of the military alliance between the U.S. and Mexico has very little to do with drugs. And really what it has to do with is ensuring the stability of the system against things that might threaten it. So, you know, you get Kelly, who's now Obama's, I mean, who's now Trump's, um, you know, whatever he's called, chief of staff, um, who said, you know, the real, the real border of the United States is with Guatemala, as though the U.S. and Mexico, I mean, this was always the dream of imperialists in the United States is that Mexico would, at some point, become part of us. So, you know, part of it got taken in 1848 and another part got bought in 1912. Um, you know, and then you had, you even had expeditionary forces that went into Sonora to try and, you know, grab part of Sonora to become part of the United States. So this is kind of the imperial dream and it still, you know, um, governs part of how the economic and security establishment of the U.S. see Mexico. So the idea that we are going to be able to maintain this as a peaceful process, I think, is, um, is an illusion. And, and, and I don't think that they have illusions about it, because, you know, why else would you have such an emphasis on, you know, this developing military relationship? You know, you have the militarization of the border. All of these things, I think, have to do with, you know, that it's a system that of in which the labor supply part is a very important component of it, but it is part of an even larger system than that in which you know the wealth of Mexico flows into the United States, whether through you know the migrants coming here as workers or whether you know the mines you know bringing in the raw material or simply the interests on you know that gets paid on the loans or the profits of the corporations that invest in Mexico and then repatriate their profits here. You know, these are all aspects of imperialism as a system, and that's what the system is like. Um, Operation Gatekeeper was, you know, kind of like a big step forward in the development of border enforcement. And so the what Gatekeeper meant, as, as we know in practice, was that um, Immigration enforcement got increased drastically in certain areas, especially urban areas. So, you know, Juarez and El Paso, you know, Tijuana and San Isidro, um, with the intention of forcing people out into more and more remote areas um, in order to be able to cross into the United States. Uh, you know, so the consequences of Operation Gatekeeper were a big increase in the number of people who died um, as a result of having to cross in, in much more hostile areas. But I think it was also a way of um, making militarization a much more popular part of a political program um, here in the U.S. So the idea that, you know, that this was a, a, a good kind of enforcement despite the cost, the human cost, all those people buried in the cemetery in Oldville. Um, you know, that I think Gatekeeper helped to popularize here in the United States this idea of border enforcement as being necessary, and even if it had a high price, well, those people should know better than to, you know, cross in these areas anyway. I don't know if you have any other yeah, uh, ways no, of looking at it, too. Yeah, no, I think that, that definitely became a uh, Part of the, the national narrative of, of you know what Timothy Dunn talks about low impact militarization um, and really great building up the military and uh, at the border but also uh, I think internally the way it started to criminalize the legal migrant or the legal immigrant within the US is where uh, we start seeing a different story as well as you know you're also criminalizing the 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 legal migrate or somebody has legal status within the, within the U.S. and I, I don't think that gets explained out enough. Um, and 
And so I, I think it, in the evolution of criminalization of both the unauthorized and authorized um, labor market within the U.S., I think we see this. I think we see this really explode in '94 after with NAFTA and with Operation Gatekeeper, and uh, and and then evolving from that to what we have today. You know, where uh, to be a lawful migrant in the states is to live by a different standard than what you would expect a citizen of this country to be. So deportable offenses become something like jaywalking or, or stuff like that for other folks. And I think it has a chill effect on, on social movement though. Um, I think you see it, you see it, for example, in the campaign that took place here in, in Wisconsin a couple years back in Milwaukee where they tried to organize a union, you know, um, at a food factory where they produce pizzas right, for Costco, and Costco has a has a their own you know their own bill of, of respect for labor, whatever that means, right? When when it comes down to it, the corporate code of conduct. Yeah, uh, yeah, and uh, and so, but you saw the, those 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 in play, you know, absolutely. The first thing there was the non-match letters. You, know, you don't match. You don't you know uh, using ICE as a as a as 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 a union group, right? And this was under President Obama, right? So the administration or this this idea that it's better the Democrats or Republicans um, has for some of us within social movement organizations and in the academy has been almost absurd, in that, right? When when immigrant rights groups or 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 who have you aligned with the Democrats because they supposedly have the best interest of the community that you're fighting for. On, on hand, and maybe they do, you know. But, but as we said, as 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 you pointed out earlier, you know, there's bigger forces at play here, and there's bigger players that, and there's a system that needs to be uh, maintained, and you know, the empire takes care of itself. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to chime in or ask a question? I'm curious about how you would respond to kind of the rhetoric that we see coming out of organizations like international level, like the UN, about this rhetoric of like migration and development and um, the possibility of like remittances being like a positive um, tool for development. Um, and also, you know, the discussion of the guest worker programs, um, how, how guest worker programs are really being pushed by these at, the, at this kind of global level as like an answer to, you know, many of these countries, I mean, you know, the Philippines, for example, is a country that, you know, has basically modeled so much of its economy around the export of its workers through kind of these legal guest worker programs around the world. And, um, you know, it seems like there's more and more rhetoric in the U.S. of like follow, of like, you know, wanting to use guest worker programs as like a win for everybody. Um, and I'd just be curious to hear You want to say anything about that, Lane? No. No? <laughs> um, well, first of all, what you're saw, talking about is, is true. That, you know, like in the trade negotiation, MOVE 4, um, they, we began to see proposals under which um, people were going to be included in the negotiations as the providers of services. So since you mode, part of the purpose of mode four was to negotiate the terms under which um, the service industry would operate on an international level, then the idea became, well, okay, and then the people themselves are the um, providers of the services. You know, I think that on an international level, that has caused a great deal of conflict among um, worker advocates and among uh, migrant rights advocates mm -hmm. over exactly the issues that, that you're pointing to. So first of all, I think it's important to say that there are people who objected to this and said we are not going to look at people and the movement of people as being um, the providers of services because this is going to lead us down the road in which um, we are going to have these massive programs which simply ship people back and forth across borders um, 
basically in the interest of employers. Um, and the people need to be considered as human beings rather than as sort of like economic um, integers in this, in this calculation. So, but there is a big um, debate about it. And on the, um, the sort of pro-contract labor side, you also find the governments of countries. So um, Gloria Macavagal Arroyo became famous, right? And because in the Philippines, you know, there was this television program in which um, they had her on and then people would call in from outside the Philippines and she would get calls from people complaining about the conditions that they were working in and she said, no, 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 you are the heroic workers of the Philippines, you, know, you must go abroad and, and you, are, you are the ones who are saving our country and our economy. And so the, you get um, the defenders of this idea, um, governments of countries, that see the remittances coming in from outside the country as helping to solve um, economic problems like foreign debt payments, for instance. So, um, you know, this is sort of like how the, and then on the other hand, you get labor organizations who um, generally on both sides of that divide, that global divide, who oppose those programs and say, you know, basically what you're doing is you're basically setting up you know, programs to keep wages low in the interest of employers um, and to talk about what the abuses are. But um, that is a big, um, you know, a big debate and a big conflict that's still going on. You know, the last figure I read for Mexican remittances, uh, for remittances from the U.S. to Mexico was $27 billion. So we're talking about a hell of a lot of money. And the remittances to El Salvador are, what, I think a third of the, GMP of El Salvador, and they become political weapons. Because remember, the election in which Shafiq Kandal ran for president um, of El Salvador on the FMLN ticket, um, who was that guy, you know, the Cuban, you know, he was in the State Department. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. God, what is his name? I'm forgetting. At any rate, um, it'll come to me in a minute. But he was working for the U.S. State Department, somebody who had been a uh, you know, an anti-Castro Cuban and then became Assistant Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs. And he went to El Salvador and he said, if you vote the FMLN into power in El Salvador, we are, you are going to have problems repatriating the money from El Salvador to, uh, from the United States to El Salvador and for El Salvadorans to go to the United States to work. And that was a very, very powerful threat. It was powerful enough so that Shafiq Kandal lost the election. You know, there may have been other reasons why he lost too, but that was a big, a big, a big part of it. And so you can see that the remittances and this flow of money becomes very, very important because it's not really going from government to government. It's going from family to family. And so... Um, you know, the Salvadoran families that thought that, you know, the, their source of survival um, was going to get cut off. You know, that's obviously had a very powerful impact on them. But, by the same token, um, is this money that goes to El Salvador and goes to Mexico, you know, the, the money that goes to Mexico, as, as large as it is, I think amounted to about 2.5% um, of Mexico's GDP, and Mexico's debt payments to the United States amount to 3%. So the money is going to Mexico, and then it's going right back to the United States. Um, and, you know, the social impact, you know, is that, you know, it takes the heat off in some ways. You know, the Mexican government has a health has a in the constitution is supposed to provide health care to Mexican people. It's supposed to provide housing. Um, neither of those things are actually taking place. The health care system is deteriorating. In front of it and the housing building parts of the Mexican government are, you know, there's no way that they can keep up with the need of Mexican people for adequate housing. And so the remittances fill some of that space.
and keep people from exploding in anger over you know, the problems that they're suffering from. And at the same time, do they provide a future? If you are growing up in Hushlawaka and you're in high school, you know, um, Juan Romaldo, we talked about this yesterday, Juan Romaldo, this friend I have, was a, now the coordinator for the Frente Indigene, a high school teacher. And Hawking, he says, you know, like I stand in front of my students and I tell them that it's important for them to stay in school and to go to the university and get a degree. And they are looking at me and they know that their brother is working in a meatpacking plant in the United States is making more money than I am. So um, the system is sort of undermining, first of all, the cultural inheritance that people have. And at the same time, it's not providing a future. Because, you know, this high school student in, in Juan Romaldo's class is looking at his future where? Not in Ustawaka. He's looking at it in terms of migration to the United States. That's where the job with the money is. Is it going to produce a, an economic base for the farm population in Oaxaca to survive? Remittances. I mean, that's sort of, in some ways, what I think people's hope is. Well, I'll get take some of this money, and I'll have a, I'll set up a greenhouse. A friend who set up a greenhouse, and we'll grow tomatoes and sell them on the market, and that will enable us to keep our land. Um, but it is a pretty forlorn hope, considering that what you really need for agriculture to survive is, first of all, control over the prices, but you also need a massive investment by the Mexican government in rural farm credit so that farmers can you know, capitalize and survive. It's not going to produce an industrial base other than the maquiladores. That's what it produces. In other words, an industrial base in which Mexican workers are sold as cheap labor in factories that produce for a market outside of Mexico. So the remittances, it's hard to separate them out from the way the whole rest of the economy functions. But essentially the net of it is, is that it's not a source of national development for Mexico. It is a source of enough money so that some families can survive and there's some degree of social stability in Mexico as a result of it. But that's about what those remittances pay for.